Welcome, my dear students and others, to this chapter's coverage of liquids and intermolecular forces. Before we get into this subject, I'd like to begin with a fun fact. So, a bacavir, shown right here structurally, is an antiretroviral drug when a virus such as HIV tries to manufacture DNA from its viral RNA. The virus unknowingly incorporates a bacavir instead of a natural component of DNA, guanosine right here, which stops the virus from reproducing. You can see the structures of these two are similar, but a bacavir kind of sneaks in there and gets incorporated by the virus where guanosine might be, which shuts the virus down. So that's an interesting structural perspective on how this drug works. Isn't that neat? All right, so after this series of lectures, which will cover the first two sections of chapter 11, textbook referenced in the description below, you will gain the following skills. You'll be able to understand the physical differences between solids, liquids, and gases, and be able to describe each of the following intermolecular forces and sort them by their relative strength. Dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole, and dispersion forces. Ready? Let's get into it. So, as we learned back in chapter 10, linked to in the description below or possibly floating over my head as an in-card link, gas molecules are widely separated from each other and are in a state of constant chaotic motion, like this. <laughs> Liquids and solids, however, are quite different because their intermolecular forces are much stronger. So remember, solids at an atomic or molecular level are like this, liquids are like this, and gases are like this. <laughs> so. In liquids, the intermolecular attractive forces are strong enough to hold particles close together. Thus, liquids are much denser and far less compressible than gases. Unlike gases, however, liquids have a definite volume independent of the size and shape of their containers. The attractive forces in liquids are not strong enough then to keep the particles from moving past one another. Thus, any liquid can be poured and assumes the shape of the container that it occupies. Solids, by comparison, have intermolecular attractive forces that are strong enough to virtually lock them in place. Solids, then, like liquids, are not very compressible, that is, you can't push them down and compress them into a much smaller volume, because the particles have very little free space between them. The particle, they're just too densely packed. The particles of solids are not free to undergo long-range movement, which makes them quite rigid. The atoms in solids, however, do vibrate in place, like this. As temperature increases, then, these vibrational motions also increase. We can see all of these descriptions of solids, liquids, and gases summarized in this table taken from our text, again referenced in the description below. You're welcome, of course, to pause the video and look this over for a few moments. All right, then, as it turns out, interconverting between a solid to a liquid and a liquid to a gas and vice versa has different names depending on the interconversion. We call those interconversions phase changes. So this table summarizes all of that, as well as the relative change in delta H enthalpy and delta S entropy for each phase change. For example, if you boil a liquid, the technical name for that is vaporization. And then if you have a gas convert back down to a liquid, it's called condensation. Solids can directly convert into gases, and you've seen this if you've ever seen dry ice convert directly to a gas without going through the liquid phase. Dry ice, by the way, is solid CO2. That process is called sublimation. Its reverse is called deposition. And the interconversion between solid and liquid in technical terms is a little more confusing. Obviously, in everyday speak, when we see a solid convert to liquid, we call it melting. But for some reason that I do not understand, in thermodynamic terms, it's called fusion. I personally dislike this one because it's easy to mix up with nuclear fusion, which is a completely different thing that we'll discuss next semester. Its reverse, which in everyday speak we would call freezing, is in thermodynamical blah, 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 terms called crystallization. I invite you, my dear students, to look them over and at least consider memorizing their names. This, of course, takes us to some beautiful sample problems. The first one says, name the phase transition in each of the following situations that indicate whether it is exothermic or endothermic. Now, I'm not going to do this for you, but I will give you some hints. The first one is, of course, solid ice converting to liquid water, and the second is liquid water in clothing converting into gaseous water. And the next question says, which of the following has the lowest boiling point, a gas or a liquid, and separately, a liquid or a solid? And our last problem asks us to arrange the following substances in order of increasing boiling point. Here's a hint for that. We should remember that solids have higher boiling points than liquids, which have higher boiling points than gases. Thus, if you look up the physical state, solid, liquid, or gas of each of these four different substances, which you're welcome to do online, you can use that information to sort them. 
And you can do something similar with any other substances that you encounter in your everyday life. That takes us to the end of this video. Please tune into the next one and we shall continue teaching you more on this subject. Until then, my dear students and other viewers, please have an enjoyable rest of your day. Oh, my God.